As the lander module Eagle safely returned the first men on the moon to lunar orbit, America's Space Administration, NASA, knew that a rival craft had crashed. This Soviet robot had smashed into the lunar surface while Eagle was landing. Only after the breakup of the Soviet Union were its lunar ambitions revealed. This rocket, bigger than Apollo 11's Saturn, was to put a man on the moon in one powerful shot. The cosmonaut was to make a spacewalk to transfer to a lunar lander, a scheme all the more hazardous for being a solo mission. But there was every chance of the Soviets landing a man on the moon in 1968, a year ahead of NASA. That there wasn't a glorious Soviet homecoming was due to the death two years earlier of Sergei Korolyov. An unmanned program continued, but with Korolyov had gone his inspired leadership in design and engineering. The Soviets had to content themselves with a few kilos of moon dust returned to Earth by robots. The moon belonged to the Americans. It was no time before the arrival of Moon Buggy. There were six Apollo landings. But they were political rather than scientific undertakings, a confirmation of America's preeminence. Although only one scientist got to the moon, lunar samples were obligingly gathered. In one-sixth of Earth's gravity, hopping was the best way to get around. Dust and rock were carted back for analysis. Years later, their study suggested that the Moon was the result of a collision between Earth and another planet. It was also confirmed that water and oxygen could be produced from lunar soil. That meant permanent self-supporting moon bases would be possible, even if one pioneer found it difficult to keep his feet. And so for home. Without a hitch, the lander clears the surface to reconnect with its command module. But those heady days have gone. NASA had spent billions of dollars on the Apollo program, and America was fighting an expensive war in Vietnam. The last Apollo splashed down in the Pacific in 1972. Since then, nobody has returned to the moon. Apollo's leftovers were concentrated on Skylab, an Earth-orbiting space station built from the tank of a Saturn rocket. Astronauts and scientists spent more than 500 days aboard this celestial laboratory. Meanwhile, the Soviets had Salyut, a whole series of successful space stations. Crews spent months in orbit, they proved the human body could survive prolonged periods of weightlessness. This was a European rocket. A joint effort by France, Germany and Britain to get into space. Today, it's become the 13-nation European Space Agency. Here, an Ariane launcher blasts off from Guiana. 
Ariane has proved reliable and commercial, efficiently delivering a stream of satellites into orbit. Nineteen eighty one. NASA had put all its resources behind a radical alternative to the rocket. Space Shuttle. The launch of a new cost-conscious era in manned space flight. Shuttle went up like a rocket, she'd orbit like a spaceship, and she'd land like an aircraft, the all-in-one reusable space vehicle. And this is how she worked. At a couple of minutes from liftoff, the two spent booster rockets fell away. They'd be recovered and used again on later missions, up to 25 times. The boosters gently parachuted into the Atlantic. At nine minutes, the fuel tank was jettisoned like a discarded can of cola. Shuttle eased into orbit. The stuff of dreams, not least for moon veteran John Young, who commanded this first shuttle, 20 years to the day since Gagarin's flight. The massive cargo bay, big enough to accommodate the Soviet's entire Salyut space station, was Shuttle's raison d'etre. NASA mothballed its rockets. With the payload doors open, the crew should be able to launch satellites, do repairs, make pickups. Reality was rather different. There were hitches and delays, and keen competition for satellite launches from Ariane. But Shuttle had much to offer. For a crew of up to seven, there was space to work, to set up experiments, and to live. Compared with the cramped conditions of earlier vehicles, Shuttle was a cruise ship with an onboard gymnasium. By the mid-80s, Shuttle had proved a qualified success. She'd gone commercial and even carried passengers. But on January the 28th, 1986, the program faltered. A ruptured fuel seal caused disaster. All seven aboard were killed. Shuttle didn't fly again for four years. And when it did, it was a strengthened vehicle with a modified brief. Shuttle made fewer flights. To some, it was still a prototype. Its crews, trainees in the business of maneuvering and walking in space. An advance guard in NASA's next great objective. The delivery and servicing of satellites would continue, but the construction of a vast multi-nation space station called Freedom is Shuttle's task for the 90s. A springboard to the moon and the planets, an orbiting interchange served perhaps by a new super shuttle. 